Welcome to Yacht Crew Vlogs, where we tell the stories of those in the yachting industry. A behind the scenes look that discovers the individuals in the industry, their history, their passions, and what inspires them to do what they do. Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria, I am your host and I'm very pleased to welcome Jason Lippert. He is the president and CEO of Lippert. How are you and thank you for joining us today. I'm great, Ria. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, you came to my attention, of course, through a mutual friend, Michelle, over at Soundings Trade Only. Um, your company, for those that aren't familiar with it, you are essentially um, a company that it's a leading global manufacturer and supplier of components for different things. So you don't actually build the actual item itself, but you make sure that every bit that is needed, for example, RVs, for yachts, for boats, um, recreational vehicles, utility trailers, building, you name it, you make sure that everything is there in order to make sure that they can continue to finish that item, correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And we, you know, to go beyond that, we do, you know, a lot of components for buses and trains and things like that too, both in in the US and Europe. So yeah, a lot of components for a lot of different vehicles. You know, uh, easiest way to think about it is, you know, it, as long as it's not an automobile, there's a good likelihood that if it's moving, we, we, you know, we make parts for that. Well, this company was founded in 1956 by your grandfather. Um, it has now grown through the leadership of your father and then now yourself uh, to almost 14,000 employees. Uh, this year, you're heading on track to quite a few billion dollars in sales, U.S. Um, let's ask about you. I want to know a little bit about you. What makes Jason tick? Who is Jason? When you were a kid growing up, because this is a family business, was that something that you always aspired to be? You wanted to be part of the business? You wanted to be CEO of this company? Or did you have other dreams? Yeah, actually, you know, I... we. <laughs> The business grew up, my grandfather founded it in a small little town in central Michigan. And, you know, at the time there were a lot of housing manufacturers right around there. So, you know, he started a little manufacturing business for building metal roofs and, um, and we, he supplied all the businesses around that area. And then they all moved away. And by the time I started growing up or came on the scene, um, you know, it was nothing but a corporate office for some businesses that were, you know, down South, maybe 10 divisions, you know, when I was in you know, middle school or grade school and high school. So I really didn't even, you know, I didn't see the business growing up. I mean, it, the business to me was my dad's office and a few of his people and they had a nice gym there. So I'd go there and shoot baskets and things like that. But of course, uh, I grew up even into college, not really knowing what the business did because my dad, you know, he kind of cut, you know, when he was running it, he kind of cut the conversation and didn't bring work home with him. So when he came home at 5.30, or six every night you know we, we never he never talked about work and um because it wasn't around the area I just didn't know what it was so by the time I graduated from college I you know I I didn't turn a couple of years uh really liked uh the manufacturing side of it um you know the engineering and the creativity and innovation and uh all the people on the floors of the business making stuff so um you know that attracted me enough to at least do an internship where I did, you know, one year as kind of a corporate uh, shadowing some people on the corporate staff. And we were probably an $80 million business when I was in college. Um, and then my, my final year in college, my junior summer in college, I, I welded, uh, welded chassis um, on a night shift for, for one of the facilities and, you know, really got my hands dirty and got to be around the people building products and kind of see what kind of products we were building and then just developed a love for that and decided to give it a shot out of college once I graduated. So do you think that makes you a better CEO that you've worked your way up from the very bottom and you understand the steps all the way to the top? Absolutely. And, you know, we, we still, we still have a training program in place for all of our future leaders based on the kind of program that I went through because it was so valuable to me, um, you know, getting to build their products, uh, just to kind of see how things work and have that understanding of not only the types of products you're building, but what the, what the frontline team member goes through on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, we're a manufacturing company, so a 14,000 people, you know, a good 12,000 of them are on the front lines of the business making, you know, these components that we send to all these various industries and products. So, 
Um, so it was valuable from that aspect and just understanding really what, you know, what the average team member goes through on a day-to-day basis. And, you know, if we don't get that, we can't make a, you know, we can't make a good business. So we make all of our leaders go through that same the operational and manufacturing leaders anyway, go through that same program. Don't care whether you had four or eight years in college, you're going through the program if you want to lead here. So good question. One thing that really struck me, um, you have a special program and you have a hundred thousand hours of community service per year that your employees do. Now, that's not something that you see very often in a multi-billion dollar industry business. Um, how did that come about and, and why? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of different reasons. I, you know, I, I'm a guy of faith. I, mean, I think God's been working uh, on a lot of us here over the years. And, you know, just how can, how can business contribute more back to society? I mean, we think of, you know, business has got to take care of, you know, the customers. Uh, business has got to take care of its team members and its people. Um, we got to take care of our, our vendors and other partners in the business. But, you know, we, we're sitting here spent, you know, contributing, you know, in our case, you know, 14,000 people's work weeks, 40 hours for every person, but yet it all goes right to the business. So, you know, we, we asked the question at one point in time, you know, what, what can we do? What can we do with that time and, and give back to the community um, and just channel some of that energy and some of our people's time back in the community. And it's actually one of, one of the team members on my staff had the idea. We have these financial goals every year and these very strategic high level, you know, numbers type related goals, but we said, hey, look, you know, let's come up with one that's not, you know, that's, that's a strategic uh, and important to us, but not, you know, not totally related to a, the, a top line or a bottom line of the business. And so we kind of try to figure out, well, what would, that, what would that look like? And, you know, we started looking at all the time we had, uh, how much of our people's time we have. And if we just channeled a little bit of that, you know, in this case, 120,000 hours a year of community service, you know, what would that look like? And, you know, so we, we, you know, we had 50 plants at the time, I think in 2016, when we started this program and we do it every year, but we had 50 facilities and we said, Hey, if every facility does three, um, three serving events a year where some leader in the facility rallies, you know, people together for a community service project and they can pick whatever they want. It can be you know, parks and recreation, it can be outdoors, it can be kids, it can be, you know, the elderly, uh, you know, animals. I mean, pick your, pick your, um, your charitable organization as a, as a facility and then do some serving events around that. And, you know, we've gotten a lot of people to participate, you know, over the years that, you know, just something that people didn't want to serve is that they don't know how to get plugged in. So really what the company's done, and we've hired three you know, philanthropy team members so that this isn't something that the plants have to figure out how to do on the side. You know, we actually have a dedicated resource in the company that helps us, you know, uh, organize some, some of these events and, and lead some of the, the, the plant leaders that want to, they have a passion for serving and, and rallying people around a service mission, give them some resources to help get some of that stuff done. So, you know, we're, you know, we're five years into that program and uh, every acquisition that we bring on, you know, we've done 70 acquisitions and my tenure and you know we, we introduced that whole concept and program into the acquisition so you know we, we kind of look at things in general one of our purposes is just a business is a force for good and how do we how do we do more good uh in in the communities and and with our business and the resources that we have and part of that's serving and more importantly we've i think we've taught a lot of companies how to do this that it's do it, that it's doable so the ripple initially was just hey what can we do with our company but now we're saying that the ripple is much bigger because we're teaching a lot of other companies how to, you know, set a serving program up like this. And it's, it's, it's relatively easy because you have a captive audience. You just have to, you know, lead them in the right direction. Well, let me ask you, we always end up when somebody provides community service and helps out within the community, we always want to know what those results were, but nobody ever asked the question of what are the results on your employees? How does that shape your team as a family, their morale, um, their ability to come together and, and create better and work better? Yeah, well, that's a loaded question. I mean, you know, you're, you're scratching on the culture question and ultimately, you know, we feel threat, you know, culture is the, the biggest, most important part of our strategy. Um, you know, we've got, again, I think the, the statistic I usually 
quote, and I, I got this from Bob Chapman. I don't know if you've ever done any research on him and culture, but you know, 88% of the people in the workforce feel like they work for a company that doesn't care about them. So, you know, you just have to ask the question, you know, how does that, how does that play out in the business? If, if the people in your business, you know, don't feel like you care. So, you know, we start with culture in our business because ultimately if we do culture right and we have good leadership development and good leadership models and values that are true, they're not just, you know, values that are hanging on the wall and we hold people accountable to values, they tend to want to come back to the business every day. And if they come back to the business every day and love and, and maybe even go so far as to say, as, hey, I've never worked at a place that, that, that treats me like this and leads this well and does what they say they're going to do that they not only just come to the business every day, they bring tons of passion and energy. So, you know, I look at it as, hey, we have 14,000 team members here. You know, they can, either, they can either be running to work, bringing passion and energy, or they can be coming to work saying, you know, hey, I, you know, it's an okay place to work, or I hate it here. And then, you know, how, how do things in the business play out? I think, you know, when people come back to the business, you know, every day with passion and energy, you know, quality, safety, efficiency, innovation, you know, they all get better in the business because you just develop this really good momentum. And I think to me, that's, you know, we compete on quality, service and price all the time, but, you know, in our business, you know, to me, culture and, you know, how plugged in and energized and passionate your people are about the business is really the competitive advantage, the true competitive advantage, because anybody can compete on you know, the, the same things that you have to compete on in a manufacturing business. But when you have people bringing passion, and energy, you know, quality service and, you know, costing and pricing all seem to, to play out better. Well, your business sort of, I know that a chunk of your business is RVs, recreational vehicles. Um, mm -hmm. And being North American myself, I mean, you know, we all know that every single household, one after the other, everyone's got either a camper, a Winnebago, uh, something, you know, and we're all heading out camping on the weekends and the bigger and better pullout you have, the better off it is. But you also are quite deep into marine as well with two companies, Lumar and TaylorMade. Can you tell me a bit about them? Yeah. So, you know, we acquired, uh, we acquired TaylorMade in 2018 as one of the larger acquisitions we've done. It was a 110 year old brand name in the marine business. And, you know, I, look, I'm in Elkhart County right now, and that's the home of, you know, home of the R RV um, industry, but uh, where 80% of the RVs are made, but there's also quite a bit of boat manufacturers here too. So, you know, we passed by some of the biggest names in pontoons, uh, pontoon boats, which is the large largest categories in the marine space. And, you know, just always trying to figure how do we, how do we get in there? And we just ultimately made a decision that, the easiest way would be to make, make an acquisition. Um, you know, we make a lot of acquisitions. We're good at integrating and Marine's definitely a space that we're close to ge geographically, but we're also close, you know, we, we go to, you know, school where our kids, you know, with some of the Marine executives around here, you know, uh, we go to church, we go to school, we we're friends. So it's like, okay, that's a natural fit. We just need to, and we make parts. So how do we, how do we get in there? So we bought TaylorMade and you know, early 2018, and it's been a great business for us. Um, um, we've expanded the tailor made name into some of the other marine products that we've we've created organically. Um, and then we we purchased Lumar um, in 2019. Lumar is largely a, a, a most of the revenues are in the 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 European yachting and big boat business. Uh, they make a lot of great products uh, for for the more expensive boats. And then we, we also, you know, distribute some of their products over here in the U.S. for some of the bigger boats, you know, here, primarily saltwater boats. So, so you know, those are our, those are our two marine businesses. And, and there's, we've got great leadership teams there. We've got great products. And, you know, our plan is Marines, maybe about 10% of our business today. Uh, our plan is to continue to grow it. Um, you know, there's the, the industry's hungry for innovation. And that's what, that's what we do best. So, uh, we're going to continue to make acquisitions and grow organically in that space and, and just fill needs that the, the boat manufacturers have. As far as the marine industry, did you see the most activity out of the U.S. or Europe this past year and a half? Did, did we see? The most activity out of the U.S. or Europe as far as needing supplies for boat? Oh, boat yeah, boat. definitely U.S. I mean, U.S., you know, you know, we went in and came out of some of the COVID-related challenges, you know, pretty quick here. 
where it seemed to kind of uh, drag drag out on Europe. And again, in Europe, I mean, you're talking about, you know, very large, very large, you know, larger boats, uh, you know, over here, you know, we make a lot of small boats. So, you know, from a capacity standpoint, you know, I don't see a lot of the big boat manufacturers going out and building new buildings or being able to, you know, expand capacity significantly just because, you know, they're making large complex products where some of the more entry level manufacturers that are cranking out a lot of small boats, they could, you know, build other smaller factories pretty quick. They could, you know, expand production and get more boats out of their system. So I, we definitely saw more of an increase here. Well, Jason, I thank you ever so much for your time. It's been extremely interesting because, you know, a lot of what you've done and especially, you know, with the community service for me, that really does hit, hit a special place because I think what a, what a better world it would be if more and more companies did the same sort of concept, just giving yeah. back a little bit. And it's not a lot when you talk 14,000 employees and you're giving back 150,000 hours per year, that's, it's nothing, but the difference it makes overall is absolutely amazing. Well, I appreciate you bringing that part up. It's important people to hear that message because it's possible. And most people, you know, most business leaders aren't thinking about that kind of thing, but hopefully when they hear stories like that, they'll, they'll start, you know, is there start... anybody within your organization that perhaps somebody, if they are interested in doing that within their own business, they could contact within your organization? Absolutely. To find out how. I, I can't tell you how many people I've, I've, that have connected with me on, on LinkedIn uh, have expressed interest and, in, Hey, how do I, how do I get started? And again, it's not that a lot of companies, um, they don't, they don't want to do it. It's just that they don't know how to get started. So yeah. we, you know, what I typically do is if they can contact me, find me on LinkedIn, it's pretty, pretty easy. Um, I'll, I'll connect them with our, our philanthropy department and our leadership there. Uh, and then they can help them just kind of give them, the, we're happy to give the roadmap out. It's, you know, it's something we're, we're happy to give out if it's going to help, help others. So. Amazing. Well, we'll make sure to put all the links down below, not only for your website, but as well for your LinkedIn in case people want to reach out and ask about that. Um, look, I encourage everyone to take a look at this company because not only do they have quality products for just about everything on the face of the planet, um, but as well, they're giving back to the community and there is no better reason to support any company that does that. I mean, you know, hands down for sure. Jason, thank you for your time. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Let's once again, you've been watching. Again. Yes, well, you're but you're welcome back anytime at all. Um, once again, you've been watching another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs. Our guest has been president and CEO of Lippert, Jason Lippert. We thank him for your for his time. My name is Rhea. I have been your host. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>